Hi, I'm Spooky Cory, and I have too many spooky tapes. Happy Halloween, everyone! It's that time of year again to wear a costume, gorge yourself on fun-sized candy, and watch a scary movie. For some of us, though, scary isn't enough. We need more. MORE! So we dig, dig through the Goodwill Graveyard until we hit something truly spooky. And nothing is spookier than the worst vampire movie of all time! <laughs> Can you die from fog juice inhalation? I'm, I'm asking for a friend. <coughs> I don't think I can do the Crypt Keeper voice the entire time. Is this good? Am I scary? Is this working? Ooh. Anyway, Club Vampire is a direct-to-video horror movie put out by Roger Corman's New Horizons studio in 1998. And yes, those are scare quotes. Although, I should say, lack of scare quotes because the movie's not scary. Boom. It's a weird and disjointed tale of some kind of romance between an exotic dancer who accidentally gets turned into a vampire and the vampire who is sent to kill her. It's Buffy meets The Hunger meets Twin Peaks meets a music video from a guy who's definitely a director because he knows a guy who knows a guy who knows a guy who knows Roger Corman. But if New Horizons knew how to do one thing, it was to make an enticing VHS cover. Just look at this thing, it just screams from the shelf. The box is everything on this one. It sort of speaks to the heyday of the direct-to-video rental market. It's designed so that it looks like it could be porn adjacent, but not so porny that it gets put behind the beaded curtain. Let's get one thing out of the way. It's not porn. But it will take a lot of creative editing for me to be able to show you clips from it, so that's a thing. Also, a quick content warning, this film contains a lot of edgy and casual sexual assault. Thanks, 90s, I hate it. And I'm going to try to cut around it unless it's absolutely necessary to the plot, which it rarely is, so just a heads up. We start this hour and 15 minute movie with about a minute of out of focus sunset footage. Auspicious beginnings. For a moment, you're thinking that this may just be ultra arty, but I'm afraid not. There's just not a lot of quality control in this one. This is as close as I can come to the light. We get some monologuing from our main vampire dude here, played by John Savage, who's the kind of actor who will appear in just about anything, really. He was in this and The Thin Red Line in the same year, if that gives you any idea of his project choice. Well, he's pining after a woman sitting on the beach smoking a cigarette. Her name is Corey. This is gonna get confusing. Please don't edit clips of me talking about Corey and make them look like I'm talking about myself in the third person. I'm pompous, but I'm not that pompous. And I think she's lonely too. His name's Zero, and he's out here at sunset. And not crispy, apparently. Hi, vampire marks, Zero. That's one of this film's two additions to the vampire canon. Apparently, when 900 years old you reach, go out into the sun for a bit you can too, hmm? This woman works at a secretive underground strip club whose entrance is the most conspicuous thing in the entire world and also kind of a vampire mouth? Irony, dumb coincidence, or none of the above? Regardless, this is the titular club vampire. Corey comes out and does a... and the camera's drunk now. Anyway, Corey kind of wanders out into the middle of the floor and tries to dance seductively, I guess, while Zero watches creepily from a balcony. Lots of very silly fetish stuff that will get my channel deleted, so go seek that out on your own. Or don't. This film's trash garbage. It's all filmed like someone's mental image of the artsiest porn or the tackiest music video. Ooh, your lighting package came with a nine light. That's really kind of standard, movie. Anyway, Corey points out at a lady in the crowd while the camera gets drunk again, but it's a fake out. She was actually pointing at some dude to light her cigarette. It's like when you see somebody waving at you, but it actually turns out that they're waving at a person behind you, and you realize that no one wants to interact with you, and you become a ghost, and your soul leaves your body. <laughs> when, when anything spooky happens, I, I, I'm legally obliged to hit this button, and the smoke comes out. Moving on, blonde lurking lady is intrigued, finds Corey, and she pays her to have sex, I guess? 
This may be a sex club with stripping elements and not the other way around. They make out, but it goes too far. The blonde draws blood and starts drinking from Cory. She's another vampire! This club vampire is just lousy with vampires. The blonde vampire then stabs Cory and kills her. Womp womp. In five minutes, we've gone from languid beach shots to drunk camera sexcapades to full-on sexual assault and murder. I'm starting to miss the languid beach shots. With his beloved dead, cue some just terrifyingly manic facial expressions from John Savage. And now we get some actual dialogue, and it's not great. What does it feel like to care? <laughs> She's cattle. Her blood sank to me, but that's something you don't remember. No. I don't have to kill to get off. Blonde Vampire Woman is overacting a storm because she knows exactly what movie she's in. And honestly, I'm for it. If more of the performances in this movie were as wild as hers, it would be a more interesting film. So Corey wakes up in a back alley somewhere. Not dead, apparently. That's good for her, I guess. You see, this horrible song brings her back to life, and she's disgusted by it. Rightfully so. <laughs> What is the opposite of a banger? This is whatever that is. She comes back home to a very sparse apartment and we meet her son. They have a really strange relationship that leads me to believe that the writer of the film has never met a teen. They argue about normal mother-son stuff, like smoking and tofu and taxes going to tobacco farmers? Hey, if I don't keep smoking, who's gonna keep those tobacco workers employed? Huh? Who's gonna take care of their families? I'll tell you, the government, welfare, my taxes. So let's keep him in play. It's my political duty to smoke. You should smoke, Max. <sighs> Tell a friend. I don't know either. I'm here with you. Trapped in an endless cycle of awfulness. Mwahaha. So we're back in the club with some very specific stock music. There's so much editing I have to do right now. Make this easy on me, movie. You know I can't show the naked twister. Nobody gets to see the naked twister. Corey is just kind of wandering the floor again. That may be her full-time job. Wandering. She gets woozy and falls and is taken to a bathroom where she's assaulted again, but this time she attacks her attacker in full-on vampire strength. Blonde vampire lady is not pleased that Corey is still alive. Camera! You have a problem! And the first step to fixing that problem is admitting you have a problem. Demons. Demons from hell. Whose victims cannot die. I think that could get us on her wall, though. <laughs> Next, I'm going to turn your world upside down. You've seen Club Vampire, but have you met the Vampire Club? Or I don't take the juice when I don't need it. I don't take the juice when I don't And I don't kill, kill just, just to get off. And yeah. here is their demon of the night dance and also rap. I'm a demon of the night and I don't dig the light. And I gotta get a fight cause I'm a demon of the night. Well, he's a new age demon of the night, but he's looking right to pass it. Cause he just can't seem to get it right cause he's right to have a Come on. Well, what do you want, Bukowski? Pull up the heat from the hot tub. 25 bucks higher than last month. I literally cannot explain the reasoning behind anything that happens in this film. I am wandering through a floating dream world of nonsense. I'm in an endless Teflon pit. I have no handholds. Vampire Club has a meeting about really boring nonsense, and then they decide that Zero needs to kill Cory to keep themselves inconspicuous and to keep the total vampire population low. Also, they casually chat while eating a person. I mean, that's kinda cool. If this movie had committed to the doldrums of day-to-day -day vampire life, we'd almost have a proto-what-we-do-in-the-shadows on our hands. Instead, we just get this jumbled mess of film school angles and just the worst blocking. What even is this frame? How does this function? What is Zero even doing down there? Be too old. Your blade is dull, teeth soft, your blood is thin. Don't you remember the law? C -c Can't we all just get along? She's the one who screwed up, not me. Why don't you ask her? 
Spacey leader vamp steals Zero's tongues, some kind of a vampire regeneration Chekhov's gun, and now we're back with Corey. She's eating bloody trash in an alley. Like you do. Fade to later that day, and Zero has shown up, does some hammy reactions to Cory's lamentations, and then just kind of wanders away when Cory books it from his weird antics. Two random dudes show up, and then they assault her, and then she rips the dude's junk off, and then they shoot her in the face, which she survives. I'm not gonna show any of that, for obvious reasons. Just gotta smash those suffering buttons, huh, movie? I'm not even really offended by this, it's just sort of weird and bad and poorly done. Anyway, let's move on. So obviously she's turning into a vampire. She stumbles home, starving, and has another stilted argument with her son. She's starving to death, gets insulted by her son, and she just kind of slugs him to the floor. He's bleeding a little bit and- Ah, no! Too spooky! Too spooky! Too spooky! Too spooky! Well, she almost eats him. It also feels kind of reverse Oedipal, if you get my drift. Just weird tension all around in this movie. So obviously, after she almost eats her son, she does the only logical thing she can. She douses herself in artsy dream blood while a hamster watches helplessly. She then proceeds to drink that hamster like a chunky Capri Sun. And then she, uh, pulls her intestines out of her mouth. I'm not familiar with that particular part of vampire lore. Yeah, just uh, just cover that up with a blanket, Cory. Nailed it. So Zero shows up, offers his assistance. Guess these vampires don't need to be invited in, huh? And they go have a night on the town. Training montage time! <laughs> She must have no soul. Okay, we're just in a different location now. What happened to the montage? They break into a seedy motel room and have a long drawn out dialogue scene that goes nowhere and just pads out the movie. There's a lot of that here. Padding. Spooky padding with contrapoints lighting. It's honestly the sort of scenes that John Savage excels at in this movie. It takes these awful little dialogue moments and turns them into meals. Not good meals, mind you, but Meals nonetheless. Anyway, Zero gets Corey a sex worker to feed from. 1998, come on. But thankfully, they don't kill her. Corey! Corey! You don't have to kill her! But I want to! I know! Uh, Corey, you took the juice. But now the juice takes you. I'm on fire! You're not on fire, Ricky Bobby! I'm on fire! You're not on fire! Okay, now we're gonna get a training montage. I can just feel it. Come on, movie, let yourself have some fun. <laughs> Wrong fun, movie. I'm watching you. I mean, I wish I weren't, but here we are. So the baddies show up after Zero and Corey have left, kill the poor sex worker. Again, 1998, come on! Max finds the bloody evidence of his mother's transformation, which was, to be fair, not very well hidden, and then we're back outside. I am trying to condense a century of training into a few minutes. Please, try to listen. Yes, do that. Preferably set to music, with no dialogue. Cut in a way to show the passage of time. Mon. Montage, montage, montage! Now, we can be hurt by decapitation, incineration, and direct sunlight. No. An exposition dump? Have fun, movie! You wasted all of your fun budget on topless scenes and that mesmerizer lens that makes the shot look all drunk. Blood sucking beasts of the night, anonymous. Thanks. Wait a minute! Okay, that's new. That was a pretty clumsy human, too. 
With this, Cory takes control of the exposition. Honestly, she should have had it the whole time. It's more interesting when the newbie pushes the limits of her new world in a scene like this. Star Andreef isn't the strongest actress in the world, but she can at least play a sort of confident desperation way. I just got one question. What happened to the fangs? Where are the fangs? Jesus, you think if they were going to destroy your life, they'd at least give you a pair of goddamn fangs? You're only an hour old. I, however, have lived for a thousand years. <laughs> a thousand years? Well, you want to see my senior citizens bus pass? <laughs> no, you don't look a day over 300. How do you do it? Ginseng. This movie is such a basic, scummy L.A. dude's take on 90s Hollywood. And in that way, in that way alone, it's kind of fascinating. You don't really know what you are. But I do. They really should have looked behind them into that spooky alley. The ominous lighting would have been a dead giveaway that something bad was about to happen. We get a fun and totally incompetent fight scene and some insanely procedural rigmarole about getting a voicemail to Max. We also get a lot of talk about the realities of escaping to Tibet for a few hundred years. What the f*** are you talking about? Your guess is as good as mine, Corey. Anyway, to quote The Lonely Island, that was kind of weird, but we're back in the club. I can't show you about three quarters of this footage, but I just want you to understand how bizarre and strange this music choice is. So I'm just gonna let this scene play, and anytime there's any piece of footage that could be objectionable in any way, I'll intercut it with some pandas or monkeys or a clip of my dog. God, I just realized something. This music is diegetic. That means that this is the music that is playing in the club. Just think of it, it's 1998. You're an LA scumbum. Your dad is a famous director or a well enough off cinematographer or something. You're third generation Hollywood, so naturally you're a sociopath. You wanna have that kind of good time with the boys that is reserved for only the truly depraved. Oh, you mean that club in the fancy mansion where you gotta know the password and everybody wears masks? Nah, dude, I'm talking about that secret underground sex club where you walk in through the mouth of a dejected Mardi Gras flute with a heroin problem. So you get your equally awful friends together, you pile into your Lexus, and you head to this wild, kinky sex club where they pipe in languid jazz music at 120 ear-splitting decibels while some dude in a plague doctor mask gingerly paddles a woman's bare butt with a cricket wicket. You know, Perverted stuff. Hey! No what? Mel, you gotta go to my house and get back. What have you done? We'll talk later. Okay? So Corey gets her nurse fake vampire friend to go fetch Max. Terrible plan. The baddies figure this out basically immediately and kill the fake vampire friend. Corey, at the very least, covers the fake friend's shift, so I guess she's not heartless after all. And her and Zero slow the movie to a crawl again as they have another pointless dialogue scene that advances neither of their characters. Joy. I haven't been able to use the fog machine in like five minutes. And that's spooky. I've seen civilizations collapse from things that could have been cured with, with a penicillin shot. I've seen cultures annihilated from praying to the politically incorrect God. All those moments will be lost in time, like tears in rain. Time to die. <laughs> Look, I know I'm not a great actor, but you don't have to be mean about it. Where do you think you're going? None of your damn business. I hope you have sunblock one zillion with you. You know, at points, John Savage almost sounds like Danny DeVito, and I would pay good money to see that movie. Corey tries to leave the club to save Max, but she, uh, forgets that she's a vampire and the sun will burn her. They both get real sad and mopey, so this is the point in the movie where they have sex, obviously. You gotta admit, it's been a pretty weird first date, huh?
I'm not gonna show it, but it's a lot of awkward kissing and weird smooshy cuddling. And it ends in the weirdest way possible. That definitely spoils the mood, huh? Anyway, Genius here is gonna run out into the sunlight to try to save Max. He thinks he can make it. He also thinks that that lip ring chain necklace combo is working on a guy that's pushing 50, let alone 900. So he goes out into the daylight. And do not adjust your picture, this is the image as it appears on the VHS tape. It's that blown out. I imagine they overexposed on purpose to symbolize Zero's pain as he struggles through sun-drenched LA. I also imagine that he could have, you know, zipped up the hoodie and pulled those drawstrings a little tighter and he would have saved himself a lot of the sun damage, but what do I know? In the meantime, Cory uh, naps dramatically? I'm gonna go with naps dramatically. Anyway, night falls, the baddies find Max, and Zero busts in looking like a budget Terminator and a Halloween store zombie had a very inexpensive baby. He also gets his idiot head cut off. Good job, Zero. Great plan. Cory wakes up from her sexy nap to find Max tied to a chair that's also a blow-up doll. Is this shot also supposed to convey sun-drenched danger? Nah, it's just overexposed. Anyway, she frees Max from bondage and gives him a rousing pep talk, which is, well, just watch. I didn't buy it. <laughs> oh, Laurie, you're so wrong. I especially, I especially like the part where she made the decision to be his mother. Oh, no, she's never been a mother. She's just going to take him home and devour him all by herself because she doesn't like to share. <laughs> you know, I liked it. She actually cried in all the right places. She took back control right when she needed to. I felt real maternal instinct. I just feel hungry. You're always hungry. What even is this film? What was director Andy Rubin trying to achieve here other than a total kitchen remodel? It has a weirdly complete point of view that's adjacent to the slacker mindset of Gen X filmmakers like Steven Soderbergh or Kevin Smith. Actually, I think that's it. I think I cracked it. My god, this movie's about Hollywood vampires. Andy Rubin was a trash and schlock filmmaker for his entire career. He only really got one bite at the apple. It was a 1992 erotic thriller that he made with his wife Kat Shea called Poison Ivy. It starred Drew Barrymore and it was pitched as sort of a fatal attraction for teens. It didn't really set the world on fire and so they went back to making movies for Roger Corman. Club Vampire feels like a culmination, a last statement a final middle finger to a system filled with gatekeeping, seemingly watched over by a judgmental and apathetic ruling class that rejected him. Reuben feels entitled to live in this world, a world he's steeped in, a world he knows the rules of, but it's also a world that denies him his opportunity to bask in the sun. Club Vampire also happens to be a weird companion piece to a movie him and Cat Shea made together in 1989 called Dance of the Damned. It's a movie in which Star Andreef stars as an exotic dancer, who has a romantic fling with a vampire. In that one, the vampire chooses to end his life by joining his paramour out in the sun. In this one, well, let's get there. A random break-in at Cory's house leads to the discovery that Zero is able to regenerate his body and reattach his head. Honestly, it's kind of a cool effect. I think this is where the money went. That being said, the only reason he can do that is because the home invader shoves his thumb into the mouth of a decapitated head? There's convenient, and then there's just hoping people won't ask any more questions at this point in the movie. He teleports away, the baddies try to kill Cory, there's some weird fumbling with a key. Is it supposed to be a secret, what Max is doing? And the blonde vamp gets a pretty fun line. Don't you just hate it when the barbecue philosophizes? <laughs> Zero reappears with the bug spray from earlier, and torches, decapitates, and sunbakes the baddies. Throw in another cringe-worthy one-liner. I'm sorry I took so long. I just had to get my head together. And we're basically done. Now we have some stock footage of a plane flying over some snowy mountains while John Savage narrates. It sounds like they got this audio walking down the street while he went to go cash his check. There are a few trade-offs. The life is funny. He may have literally phoned it in. Anyway, it all goes to my grand Hollywood theory, I guess. They leave LA for a land of simplicity and deprivation. Zero and Corey may have lost their lives, but they'll never lose their souls. So that was Club Vampire, a slice of high trash that may have something more lurking at the core of its weird, jaded little heart. I can't bring myself to truly love it, but if you manage to find it in your local thrift shop, give it a watch. 
It's an idiosyncratic detour you may just enjoy. Thank you for watching Too Many Tapes, and thank you all so much for getting me to 100 subscribers. Please like and subscribe, and tell me in the comments below what your favorite Z-tier direct-to-video horror movie is. I want to track down more of these on VHS. A special shout out to Chase Smith, who just recently joined my $20 a month Patreon tier. You bought the gels this month, and now I can be spooky whenever I want! Ha ha ha! I, uh, I, I had to, I had to get that in one last time. It's really foggy in here. I'm gonna set off my smoke detectors at some point, I just know it. Anyway, if you'd like to help me keep making stuff like this, please donate to my Patreon. The link is in the description. And if you donate five or more dollars a month, you get your name here, in the spooky zone of spooky power. Next time we're trading horror for magic, leaving the world of today, and entering a world of yesterday, tomorrow, and fantasy. See you next time on Too Many Tapes.